been around for thousands of years. Many messages, fervent messages, have been preached by some of you among us and others as well. Revival meetings, weeks on end, have been preached out of this book. As I started to focus on that, I almost got discouraged. That what do I have to share? It's nothing new. It's the same message that has been being preached for generation after generation after generation. So what? What is important? And that's the question that kept going through my mind. What? What is important for me to share? Uh, and as I thought of that, I thought, you know, this is my first message. But I have no guarantee that this isn't my last one either. And if this were my last one, what were, what would be the most important thing for me to share? And as I started to focus on that, uh, this, this has been going on for four, four weeks now. My mind has been rolling around wondering what to share. And in that process, I was listening to uh, a message by uh, Skip Heisig from Calvary on, the, uh, on YouTube. And uh, I don't remember what his message was. But he made one comment that caught my attention. He said, it's not so important that you know God as it is that God knows you. And that kind of caught my attention because in my mind I was thinking of the most important thing for man is to know God, to have a relationship with him. And that in part is true. But his comment about that God knows you, I was like, God does know us. He made us. He had a plan for each one of us. Of course he knows us, but it's more to it than that. He made the comment, then uh, following, following that statement, he made the comment, he said, if you were to go to the White House and you can breach the security fence or go to the gate and you try to gain access to the White House and you tell them you're a friend of Biden, the president, it won't gain you much ground. But if the president comes out and says, yeah, he's my friend, you have access. And that's what brings Leviticus to the question or the fact that it doesn't matter if you know God, but God needs to know you. As you think of the, the Bible, years old, thousands of years, you think back of where it starts, creation of man, of the history coming down through the ages, down to where the change of dispensation to mercy and grace by Jesus Christ, and then on down through the ages to us. You know, if you look at it, it's really a story of love. And it's still in process. It's not complete. You look at the, you go into the bookstore, you go into the romance section, and it's pretty common, pretty prevalent for a romance novel or story to have three characters, two men and a woman. One of the men a little in the background, one a little bit in the forefront, and the lady completely in the front. Why is that? As I started to think about the Bible being a love letter, a exp- story of love, that's really what it is. It's God expressing his love for man. In the beginning, he made man for himself. He made us in his image, in his likeness. that we don't have the ability to be righteous like he did. He gave us the right to choose, the right to serve him. We could choose. And then Satan enters, Lucifer enters into the picture, that second character, and the battle began. And we're in the front. As you think of that romance novel, we are the ones in the front. The struggle is there, it's ours. We're going to choose between one or the other. 
And that's the important part of man, for man. As you think of that situation, the Bible, you know, it's 66 books, 44 authors, covers 1,500 years, written in different languages, two different dispensations, the law of the law and judgment in the earlier part, in the, in the Old Testament, then we have mercy and grace in the new, di, uh, new dispensation or in the dispensation that we are in today. When God created it, giving us that choice, freedom of choice of serving him or going with uh, Satan's design of serving self and the carnal nature, that really was the only way that true love could be there. The devotional that Simon had this morning, he brought out the fact of uh, faith, hope, and charity. And the greatest of these is charity or love. What would it be in a relationship that wasn't by free will? What is love if it's not by free will, by choice? For you that are married, how would it be if your wife didn't choose to be your wife, but was chosen by someone else to be your wife? And there are, there are places where that's the, the case. But true love only comes, can only exist where there is a voluntary commitment in that way. And that's why God set it up in the way that he did. He wanted to have a relationship with man for each one of us. And that is where true love exists. In the garden setting where God had made man, put man, placed him in the garden, we call it paradise. And I think it was every bit of that in that setting. But when Satan entered in, into that setting, the scene changed and the uh, tree of life was in that setting and God removed man so that we would not have access to that and forever be left in that state. Because he loved us. He was looking out for our good. And so he changed things. And earth became a prep room. Preparation for another gathering to where we're going to give it, be given the, the right to that tree of life. Let's focus a little bit on, on well, let's just focus on, on the fact that God wants a relationship with us, and it's good for us to not only know him, but to be known of him. Let's look at Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22, starting in verse 1. And Jesus answered, Matthew chapter 22, verse 1. And Jesus answered and spake unto them again by parable, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king, which made a marriage for his son, and sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding, and they would not come. Again he sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them which are bidden, Behold, I have prepared my dinner, and my oxen and my fatling are killed, and all things are ready. Come unto the marriage. But they made light of it and went their way, one to his farm, another to his merchant. The remnant took his servants and entreated them spitefully and slew them. That thought that I shared this morning, there's many places that you could have gone this morning. And as we go through the week, there's many places that we can go, and our heart does go that are different than what God has designed and desires in a relationship with him. We see the, the people in this parable, the choices that they made, seemed very disrespectful. But as we consider what God has done for all of us and his desires, and some of the things that we get distracted by, we think of Peter walking on the water. Oh, an awesome experience must have been taking place there. And yet in those 
I don't know, seconds? I almost said minutes, but I don't think it was that long that Peter was out of the boat until he was distracted, and instead of going to the master, to Jesus, all of a sudden he started to look at the, the waves, and he got distracted and lost his footing. Verse 7, And when the king heard thereof, he was wroth, and he sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their cities, and said, and then saith he to his servants, The wedding is ready, but they which are bidden are not worthy. Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as ye find, bid to the marriage. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all as many as they found, both bad and good, and the wedding was furnished with guests. And when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there was a man which had not a wedding garment. And when he say, and he saith unto him, Friend, how camest thou in hither, not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Preparation. That man had made it to the wedding, but no preparation. What do we do in our setting today to prepare, to be known, to when we sit there, that we are recognized for, for who we are and the right to be in that wedding ceremony? This man had come in without a wedding garment, and I don't know for sure what all is involved in that, but I think of a man that, or a person, I should say, that has the ability to come in to a situation and may have been given advice, but he has a thought of his own. He knows how to do it, maybe better than what he was told. Or he has his own interests. It doesn't matter to him what the... What the plans are or what, what the expectations are of others it didn't pay off. It says there in the verse 13, they took him out, took him out of the wedding. He missed the opportunity that, that he had actually come for because of not doing proper preparation and acceptance there. As you think of, of knowing Jesus, knowing God. How many of you know uh, the, about the Lucas Stadium in Indianapolis? Can someone tell me, what does it represent? Who stands, who's, who's in the Lucas Stadium? Football, but who is the team? The Colts. I, I used to get a little bit of a kick out of it uh, when my sons were younger. Sometimes we'd have a little conversation about sports, and uh, I'm not quite sure even which team they would root for. Maybe I should ask them since they're here this morning. Um, they would use the term, we are going to win, and I would say, we who? Because if we were to go down to, if it was the Colts they were rooting for, I'm not sure who it was, if we would have gone there and we would have stepped inside the door, none of them would have known who we was including, that we were going to win. They were the team, and there was other people that were, uh, oh. yeah, idolizing or claiming rights to it. Elon Musk, how, was, how many of us know him? Probably, well, if you read the news at least. You have some indication of who he is, but Elon Musk doesn't go out. How much effort are we putting into that? Probably not that much, but I'm just using that as an illustration that uh, as we consider knowing God, we are here at a worship service because of, because of him, I trust. But what for, what for effort have I put in? At the end of, at the end of time, we're going to win, but does God know me when we get to that point? Some of the things that I came, thought, that came to my mind as I considered the fact of trying to, to uh, be in a place, do what I can to, to be known of God. Let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 14. Second Corinthians seven verse fourteen. Let's 
not the reference that I wanted. I'm not sure what the reference is to the verse. But uh, the, the verse that I was after is, If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray, and seek my face, and... Thank you. Let's try Second Chronicles. Yes, that's correct. Second Chronicles 7, verse 14. If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and will heal their land. Just picking out a couple words there. Humble. If my people shall humble themselves. What does it take to be humble before God? As we consider an almighty God, a God that is creator of all the universe as we know it and beyond what we are able to comprehend. Certainly that should humble us. But I think there's more to it as I think of humbling myself before God is giving recognition to who he is in relation to my spiritual being and the provisions that I can only get through him. Nothing, some, nothing that I can procure or to work out my own salvation, but it's only through him, and he's the only one, to humble myself before him and accept him as my Lord and Savior. The next word in there that uh, says pray. Take time to pray. As we think of prayer, how much time do I have for that? You know, we have a tradition of, of uh, bowing our heads before we pray. But I wonder sometimes if my prayer were written out on the wall. We go to a restaurant and we bow our heads for prayer. If my prayer would be written out on the wall, what would it be? What's the length of my prayer? Does it matter on the setting that I'm in, on who's watching? My worship to him as I bow my head in prayer. You know, you take uh, a young man and he's infatuated with a young lady. You can hardly keep him off the phone. It's high time to be in bed and sleeping and they're still on the phone. A love relationship, an interest, an endeavor. But when it comes to prayer, do I have a relationship? Am I praying because of a relationship, a desire? Do I run out of lack of words? I've never seen a boyfriend and a girlfriend run out of words. Somehow they just keep on visiting. That, that interest in each other. What does it involve when I go to pray? Maybe taking the next phrase into, into, context, uh, into the same context of prayer, and seek my face. You know, it's not just a matter of saying words, no, thank you for the food, or Lord, you take care of that situation but it's something that pulls at my heart. I come to him because he is able. He is the one that has all the power. There's no limitations. He can do as he pleases, but we come to him as a father, as a child. The Bible says unless we become as a child, we're not going to be able to be in the kingdom. We come to him with that commitment, that surrender, knowing that he can, but that he has a plan of his own. And he has made that plan from the beginning, before time began until eternity passed. It's all there. It's just unfolding. We don't know it. 
And so we come to him as a, as a child, as a father, as a child to the father, seeking his approval, asking his interest in what's dear to our heart. Seek my face. You know, we can't look on God, the Bible says that, as mortal man. But do we have a desire to see him someday, to be face to face? I trust we do. And because of that, he will give us that interest, that urgency. And as we bow for prayer, to focus on the important part. I think of Queen Esther, the effort she put in the desire that was on her heart for her people, the time that she spent. Not only did she go in and risk her life and, and get what she was looking for, that scepter being put out, she could have presented her cause right there. But she put time and effort in making sure that it was proper time. Pursuing the king on behalf of her people, I think that takes... Puts a, puts a certain element of prayer in, that we come to God and seeking his face, putting forth effort, time. How high is it on our priorities? The last part of that verse says, turn from their wicked ways. <clears throat> it takes effort, a commitment, a choosing. To some degree, it's like a salmon going up up river. I don't know have you all ever watched that or not, but it's interesting to see them and the amount of obstacles that those fish will be able to, to uh, what is it, be victorious? It's not the word I want, but to overcome the ability that they have of overcoming obstacles and the effort that they put in. As I think of my, my commitment to Jesus Christ and how much effort am I going to put in we say it's a 180-degree turn when we make our commitment to Jesus Christ from the direction we were going in our carnal nature to turning to serving the Lord. And I think that's probably a very, very apt illustration of turning around and going upstream, putting forth effort. We, the Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and dominions. It takes more than what I have to offer. It's more than I can do. I can't just go to the uh, gym and work up my muscles. I can't just go into my study and study until I have the power. But it's continually coming back. Turning, seeking his face, praying, humbling myself, and then turning from my own self to his recognizing that he is the one that has that power for me. John 14, John chapter 14, verse John chapter 14, verse 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. Very clear, very easy to understand. If you love me, keep my commandments. And we know that the illustration, if you, don't, if you want to, you don't have to. If you don't want to, then, then it's a commandment. You have to. That's the only alternative. But it, it will never work to do it because we have to. God wants us to have that desire to where it's not a commandment. His commandments are not grievous because we want to, because we love him. That's because of the relationship that we have with him. <clears throat> 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Study to show thyself approved unto God. Effort, putting in, putting in effort. Um, the, uh, as I think of studying to show thyself, we need to get into the word to know. If, if I were to tell you that uh, this pulpit is blue, you would, wouldn't take very old child that would tell me that this pulpit is not blue. But how come isn't it? What makes you think that this pulpit is not blue or red?
Do you think that through? The only reason that I say that this pulpit is not blue is because of my mother, which is here today. Taught me that this is brown. If she would have taught me from little up, and especially when I was young, if she would have told me that this pulpit is blue, it would have been blue and you would all been wrong because my mom knew. So when you take the word of God, the Bible says, study to show thyself approved. Are you here because of what dad said? Is your relationship with God such because of what the preachers have said? How, do you have, how does it happen you have a relationship with God? Or have you sought and looked into where the real answer is and said, that's why? And I, think, I challenge each of us to dig into that. You know, the Bible is over 2,000 years old. How much do I know about it? And I just became really aware of that in the last four weeks. Study to show thyself approved unto God. We need to put forth effort into knowing what God wants, what his desires are. Sometimes, depending on what happens at home, uh, depending on what Virginia does, I say, how did you know? Or why did you do that? She says, I know you, I married you. It's because of relationship that she knows. And we need to do the same thing as we look into God's word is to study, to know the desire of his heart. What is best for me? What is his desires for me? So that I, I can be there and meet the qualifications to have that relationship with him. Again, not just accepting what, what man has said or what dad has said or the preachers have said, but because the, the word of God says that. And that gives me a confidence to stand on. God's word never changes. Let's look at Acts chapter 17, verse 22 through 31. Acts chapter 17, verse 22 through 31. For as I passed by behold your, and beheld your devotion, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God, whom ye therefore, whom therefore ye worship, excuse me, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you, God that made the world and all, that, all things therein, seeing that he is the Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands, as though he needed anything seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on the face of the earth and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your poets have said, we are of his offspring." For as much then as we are the offspring of, of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone engraven by arts and men's device, and, that, and at the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man which, whom he hath ordained, and whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, in that he hath raised him from the dead. A number of different places that we could, could uh, pull out of that scripture that uh, would tie into the thought of, of being, uh, being in a place where we can know God or that God can know us. But uh, just looking at the, the uh, verse 23, the unknown God, do I know the God that I stand for, who I represent, who I speak for? Do I really know him? Or am I just worshiping a God because that's the right thing to do, or that's what we do in this setting? 
or that's what my family's doing? Is it a choice that I have made to where it's not an unknown God, but he's known of me and I am known of him? Verse 24. You know, he's really, he is our creator. He's our maker. He's the one that made us. He gives us life, verse 25. He gives us life and breath and all things, whether I choose to serve him or not. I'm in his hands. Verse 31. The, he hath given assurance unto all men in that he hath raised him from the dead. You know, there's, there's all kinds of evidence that Jesus rose from the dead. There's even, even documentation in secular history, if you want to dig into it. I'm not, I haven't done that. I just have read of people that have done that. There's documentation there of some of these things that sometimes we grapple with, wondering if they are true or if they are just something that has been written by man down through the ages. But to experience what God has done for us and have that hope that only comes through Jesus Christ and his, his saving grace gives assurance to where uh, not only do we uh, serve God because of our own ability or our own interests, but we start to serve him because of the concerns we have for our, our family, our neighborhood, our community, our nation, and the world in general. So maybe in closing here, again, the importance, do I know God? It's important, but does God know me? Revelation 7.23 says there at the uh, last judgment, there are people going to acknowledge what they have done and claim credentials of what they have already done, visiting and all kinds of things that they have done in his name and in He's going to say, I never knew you. And it's going to be like going to the, the oil, uh, Lucas Stadium in Indianapolis and walking in and trying to identify with the, the team there. They say, we don't know who you are. When we get to that last judgment, it's imperative that God knows who I am. Have I put forth the effort to be known of him? Have I met the requirements? Have I done what I can in my setting to choose and to put forth effort to know the desire of his heart, to accept his provision? We don't have to be anxious. We can just relax and accept the provisions. He has made all the provisions. He's done all the packing that's needed for the trip. You don't have to do any preparations on that part. He says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. He's ready, he's willing, he's able. But we don't have to choose. We can do as we please. I came across a statement the other day that was kind of, it was kind of funny. But yet it brings out a thought. And the statement that I came across was, a woman without a man is like a fish without a bicycle. And I'll let you guess who, where, which side of the house that statement came from. A man... A woman without a man is like a fish without a bicycle. You know, we can, we can go on through life, and we can go our own way. We can do it as we wish. We can live it as we want to. When it comes down to it, there's a day of reckoning. There's only one way that works, and God has made that available to man. He's given us the, the uh, reconciliation through his Son, to be acceptable in his sight, to be known of him. It says, come unto me, all ye that labor and heavy laden. It doesn't matter how heavy a load you have. He's there waiting, ready for us, desiring to have a relationship with him. Psalm 1611 says, thou wilt show me the path of life. He's going to make that way known. He's a light to our feet.
in thy presence is fullness of joy. And I trust that's what our desire as we think of a relationship with Jesus Christ is not just for the here and now, but for that moment when he's going to open up that door to us, allow us to have the right to the tree of life in his presence. Let's stand for those that are able for a word of prayer. And Steve Miller, would you lead us in prayer?